Michael Vonnen. Welcome to the Tolkien Lore Channel. This is the Tolkien Geek, and today in this video, I'm going to be talking about the story of Kulervo. Now, uh, this one is a little re more recent than most. This is a, uh, I believe the Kindle edition of this was available late 2015, and then the hard copy came out uh, in April 2016, and it just took me a while to finally get to it and read it. Um, but this book is interesting because it details Tolkien's first real efforts in writing fiction, or one of his first efforts in writing fiction, and it ties a lot of things together in terms of his background in older folk stories and how that really plays into his own mythology, and especially the Silmarillion. So... It'll be really interesting to look at this and get an idea of how he got some of his ideas, how some of those, you know, developed over time and played into his overall mythology. So let's get going. So first off, what is the story of Kulervo? Well, the primary source for this is a Finnish folk tale that Tolkien first came across as part of a collection that was put together by a, uh, an academic in Finland and the collection itself was called the Kalevala, and it's a collection of folk stories. The stories themselves were actually uh, relayed by song, much as you know most stories were in the old days. I mean, you had no writing, and so most people e told stories by singing or chanting long poems, essentially. This is basically what Beowulf is and a lot of the other major stories that we know about from you know the pre-literary age. And in particular, the story of Calervo is about a, uh, a guy whose father is killed. He is then uh, essentially held by the fa his father's killer along with, depending on which version you read, and this is kind of where Tolkien's own development comes in, but uh, his mother slash sibling siblings and he is eventually sold off as a slave to somebody else, comes back, avenges his father by killing his murderer, and ultimately ends up having incest with his sister and then kills himself. Those of you familiar with the Silmarillion can probably already tell where this is going, um, but before I get to that, let me kind of go a little bit more into Tolkien's own development of the story. So the original story was pretty bare bones. It didn't have a lot of emotional depth or psychological complexity or anything like that. It was basically Kulervo, you know, these things happen to Kulervo, Kulervo does these things, and there's no real psychological realism to it. The character is pretty flat, and a lot of old stories are kind of like that if you, you know, really look into a lot of old, old stories. Uh, the, the more complex nature of psychological motivation and that sort of thing doesn't really get going until later on, but in this particular case, Tolkien encountered this and he thought the story itself, while you know not terribly well developed, was at least a very interesting and tragic story. In fact, that's how he described it, was a very tragic story. And the reason he even came across it in the first place was, or I may be getting the order wrong, but Either his love of the Finnish language introduced him to this, or this introduced him to his love of the Finnish language, which is interesting because Finnish ends up kind of forming the basis in some ways of his own Elvish languages. He loved the aesthetics of Finnish, and because of that, he used uh, a lot of inspiration from the Finnish language in developing the aesthetic for Quenya and Sindarin and some of his other Elvish languages. So there's a lot of interesting tie-ins between this story and his mythology, but it definitely gets a lot deeper, and that's where I'm about to go next. So, as I mentioned, the character in Kulervo, uh, Kulervo himself, uh, ends up having incest with his sister and then killing himself. Now, as I mentioned, if you read the Silmarillion, you kind of know where this is going, because this is reminiscent of the story of Turin Turambar. And, of course, his story is the great tragedy of the Silmarillion, you know, the, the entire collection of Silmarillion stories. Turin is the tragic character in the Silmarillion, and Kulervo matches him up pretty well. Now, in the original story of Kulervo, there's a lot of um, 
detail missing that Tolkien then adds in his own version of Kalervo. He, he read the story as it was set out in the Kalevala collection, and then he rewrote the story. Well, I shouldn't say rewrote because he didn't really change much, but he added a lot. He kind of changed a few things to fix what he saw as being uh, paradoxical or just didn't really fit together very well. Um, some of those being when his when Kulervo's sister was born, you know, whether he knew his sister before he was sold off into slavery and that sort of thing. But there's some other interesting elements that are also uh, tied in with the Turin legend. For instance, uh, whenever Kulervo kills himself, he does he speaks to the sword that he's carrying and basically asks it to kill him, and the sword speaks in answer. And that's, of course, very similar to what Turin does at the end of his story. He has the black sword, which is has various names over the course of the story, Anglachel, and uh, I forget the other words, but um, it's the same kind of thing. Now, the, the speeches given by the swords are very different, but the idea definitely held, held some kind of a it had a hold on Tolkien's mind because he ends up reusing it. Uh, and there's other things about the story that match up really well, but I don't want to get into too many of the details because it's more interesting to read it for yourself. Uh, one interesting point, though, is one of the additions that Tolkien made to the story was a dog named Musti, which in Finnish basically just means blackie. I mean, it, it's not really a, a fancy name. It's just a a name that any Englishman might give his dog just in a different language. But the the hound Musti ends up being one that can speak, has some magical properties, looks out after Kulervo, and you can see another parallel here, which interestingly is not to Turin's story, it's actually to the story of Beren and Luthien. And that's really interesting because you see the germ of more than just one story in Kalervo, even though it's mainly a parallel to the one story of Turin Turambar. So that's another interesting point that, you know, it's interesting to read this and see where Tolkien is starting to develop some of his ideas and starting to really expand on this kind of thing. And of course, in in the actual story of Kulervo, there wasn't really a hound called Musti. So this is actually an invention of Tolkien's own that he adds to the story and later uses in a totally separate story in his own mythology. So there's very obviously going on here a both a borrowing from an older tradition and pure invention on Tolkien's own part. So it's not just that he's stealing some elements from a story and then making it bigger and turning it into his own mythology. He's also creating elements of his own. And it's really interesting to see that process at work. Now, the 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 one thing I will say about the story of Kulervo, it's got, um, it's obviously a fairly early attempt at doing fiction. It's got a mix of both prose and poetry on Tolkien's part. And you'll see that that kind of happens in his later works, The Silmarillion and The Lord of the Rings, because he'll throw in poetry every now and then not usually as a part of the narrative, but usually as a, you know, this happened within the story. Whereas in the story of Kulervo, a lot of the times it's actually part of the narrative. It just switches to a poetry style and then back to prose. But there is also some element of that that carries over to the Silmarillion because Tolkien also wrote some of the stories in the Silmarillion in a poetic style. If you, uh, pick up The Lays of Beleriand, which is the um, fifth, I believe, uh, not volume in the History of Middle-Earth series, you can get most of those poems, and I'll link to that book in the description below. But it's just really interesting to see how the style and all that really plays in. But the one thing that is a little bit weird is because this is a really early one, his writing style is not nearly as developed as it is later in the Silmarillion and Lord of the Rings, and so it's not, you know, for those of us who picked up Tolkien and were just amazed at the wordsmithing, you know, the, the way he uses language, it's, it doesn't live up to that level because it's a really early, un, um, unedited in, in a lot of ways. It's not totally unedited, but it never reaches that full uh, 
form that you know the Lord of the Rings and the Silmarillion did. So it's not you're not going to read this and get a whole lot of just absolute reading pleasure out of it unless you just happen to like its style. I mean, if you if you really like Tolkien's style, this is not the Tolkien style that you're really familiar with. But it's it's more interesting because it's got um, it, it's more interesting to show the development of his ideas. And in addition to having the story itself, it's actually got a lot of commentary by the editor. Verlin, I'm sorry if this is, I don't know if it's Flieger or Flieger, um, but that, that that is a Tolkien scholar who apparently, from what I gather in the book, actually did a, um, either as a doctorate or some other academic publication, earlier had done something on the story of Calervo and now is actually publishing this book with more information. Some of that information is, you know, commentary on other things that Tolkien was doing at the time and, you know, how it fits into his overall legendarium. And so that you get more than just the, the story itself and you don't have to piece it all together in your own head. Flieger does a lot of that for you in, in an end section where it goes into the, how the story connects to the Silmarillion in a lot of ways. And that section is in some ways the best part of the book because the real value in it is seeing the, the connections between these really early things and what Tolkien ended up doing that we all know and love. So anyway, that basically is the story of Calervo, and that's why I think if you're really into Tolkien and especially the Silmarillion, you should probably pick it up. So I will link to this also in the description. And other than that, I think that pretty much wraps up my discussion of the book. So I hope that uh, influenced you to maybe go pick up Story of Calerbo or maybe even look into the Silmarillion if you haven't already. Uh, if you'd like to see more information about Tolkien and the worlds he created, please subscribe to the channel. If you like this video, please like and share. And until next time, I'm the Tolkien Geek signing out for the Tolkien Lore Channel. Namariye.